All right, so the recording has started. This is the March 5th, 2019 Crossplane Community Meeting. And as always, we'll go ahead and start this meeting with a uh, milestone checkup. So um, let's take a quick look at the roadmap here. So we are in the middle, uh, or towards the end actually, of the 0 0.2 milestone. The first release of uh, Crossplane when the repo was taken public uh, was right before KubeCon Seattle uh, around the beginning of December. And we are looking to do, uh, in 2019 here, get on a quarterly release cadence, which would be setting us up for a 0 0.2 release, um, you know, after taking a nice little break from 0 0.1 and the holidays and everything, uh, this will set us up for a 0 0.2 release sometime uh, later in this month in March. And then a 0 0.3 release sometime uh, around uh, June or so, around KubeCon Barcelona is when we're targeting that. So we're in the middle of the 0 0.2 milestone right now. And the focuses for the 0 0.2 milestone uh, were around a few things. One of them was around uh, workload scheduling. So to be able to start influencing and have uh, a, the initial implementations of the scheduler, which makes uh, smart decisions or user influenced decisions about where a workload should run, you know, which cluster or which cloud provider, et cetera. Ilya has written a design document on that and did the first phase, uh, first implementation of the scheduler where you can start influencing it with uh, selectors or predicates uh, to influence where a workload will be scheduled to run. Um, so that's already in master. And I think that was kind of a large chunk of what was anticipated for 0 0.2. Uh, there is more discussion, um, I think, on 2.79 about um, the scheduler being location aware. And I think that there is, as Ilya has commented on this issue here, there is more, there's a little bit more context that needs to be fleshed out for, um, you know, what does location mean and how from a, a user experience perspective and from a context capturing perspective uh, for the workload and the scheduler, we can you know, capture that information about location and plumb that down through the, through the scheduler. So, I think that there's more design work to do here that'll be part of uh, you know, more grander vision of the scheduler design. And Ilya, let me know if you have anything to add to, to that assessment. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Awesome. Okay, and then uh, we had another focus that was on enabling new uh, support for new managed services that can be um, you know, deployed and configured and managed by Crossplane for workloads to consume them. The set of managed services that we had decided upon was influenced by our uh, partnership with GitLab uh, because the, excuse me, the longer term vision here for 0 0.3 is to be able to automatically uh, or deploy in an automated fashion the GitLab uh, pr project and their entire stack. And so some of the managed services that re they rely on are object storage buckets, um, Postgres database, and Redis cache. Uh, so we wanted to s focus on making sure that the resources that GitLab requires to deploy uh, is also supported in Crossplane so that we can mm, execute or implement that fuller vision of having GitLab automatically deployed by Crossplane. So Nick uh, recently finished up the Redis support across all the three major cloud providers that we support so far, uh, for Azure, AWS, and uh, Google as well, which uh, Nick, that's in master now, is that correct? Yeah, I believe uh, Ilya merged it uh, yesterday. All right, sweet. So that's a very recent update then that we have Redis support uh, across all three cloud providers. Uh, so that is exciting. And uh, we have Postgres support, uh, I think last month got made that to master. So with those two managed services, we have the foundation of the services that are required for GitLab and we will start being able to focus uh, more on uh, the other application requirements for GitLab about how to package the rest of their components and how to define these uh, dependencies and all that sort of stuff. So I think Nick will be diving into that 
with the uh, with the GitLab team um, and start fleshing that out. And so that's uh, that's targeted for 0 0.3. So that's not something that is anticipated to be finished within the 0 0.2 milestone. And that will be a much larger effort. Um, I'm excited to have expertise on on that one. And then another, the third major focus that we have the 0 0.2 milestone, which is ongoing. Um, this one is not completed, is about how we can uh, integrate Crossplane uh, with other types of services that deploy directly to Kubernetes uh, using a, an operator. Um, you know, one of these, uh, you know, that we're very familiar with because of our experience is Rook, which, you know, has a set of operators for uh, Ceph, distributed storage, and CockroachDB, and Cassandra, and some other ones. And so this is a design effort and also a, um, a early implementation effort on, in a, on how, in addition to supporting cloud provider services, uh, you know, Amazon RDS or Google Cloud SQL, things like that, how we can also support um, portable workloads uh, that are backed by, um, you know, services that are running directly inside of a Kubernetes cluster using the operator pattern. So expect to see more of this um, design and um, soon implementation uh, as well coming very soon. All right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the um, at the zero two milestone since uh, we kind of defined what the major major focuses were for it. And so we have a set of tickets here uh, in the milestone. We are more than halfway through. And we have a set of tickets here that, um, you know, about half of them, I guess, have owners. And then the other ones um, are, you know, open for anyone from the community who wants to jump in on them and, um, and contribute to them. Uh, we've had some conversations on some of these and, you know, we're happy to assign issues to anybody that uh, expresses interest in them and wants to submit a pull request. Um, I think that there's, there's not, let's see if the, I think that on here, there's not too many that I am very worried about. I think the biggest one we have left is still, uh, you know, the managed services using the Kubernetes operating operator pattern. I think that's still got the most, you know, design work and things to worry about. Um, but these other issues on here, I don't, there's not large concerns I have um, about them in this milestone. Are there any, uh, any comments that anyone has on any of the uh, issues on here or uh, questions about them or anybody that um, you know, is expressing interest on potentially taking on some of these issues? Yeah, the zero dot two. Oh, go ahead. No, I see. I think I'll take a look later. We talked about the architecture. I don't see if there's anything else we can pick off. Yep, that sounds great, John. Yeah, I think the zero dot two project board should be in uh, in agreement with the zero dot two milestones. I think should everything should be up to date there. And um, you know, yeah, any of these issues here that are unassigned uh, should be pretty much up for grabs. If anybody uh, comments on them or expresses interest uh, offline after the meeting. Okay, so uh, we can now move on to the community topics and questions. And Omar, you added a, um, an item here to the agenda uh, about, will there be a need to implement and support multiple cloud provider services, S3, Redis, Elastic Cache for each provider? Uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna talk a little bit about that, Omar, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and kind of flesh out that question here in the group? Yeah, what, what I wanted to ask is, uh, so every, every cloud provider has a tremendous amount of, of services. And I just wanted to, to know if uh, like you plan to support and to implement all of the services that uh, cloud providers offers, or um, uh, are you, do, you, do you mean to support only the ones that, uh, only a few, few amount of them and then uh, what's what's your plan there, Action? That's the question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Omar. Um, 
So the, there's a couple, couple different uh, facets to that question. Um, one of them is that, um, you know, it would be, it'd be nice to have support, you know, for uh, as many cloud uh, provider managed services as possible. The focus so far has been on services that um, you know are built on an open source technology with a um, you know open protocol a, like a wire protocol that's standard and a lot of applications uh, take a dependency on. So MySQL and Postgres and you know buckets with S3 protocol. You know those are all examples of resources or services uh, that have a fairly standard um, open protocol that a lot of applications uh, are already consuming. And so to help with the goal of workload portability, of you know, being able to just simply express, uh, an application can express the uh, need that it has on the protocol, such as MySQL or, or Postgres, and then the underlying implementation from whatever cloud provider it may be, um, you know, will satisfy that particular protocol and, you know, thus making the application portable. That's been the initial focus. Um, you know, portability is, is very powerful as a concept to enable for these applications. So implementing cloud provider services, uh, you know, that are built on open source with open protocols is, has been the focus. So that gets into, you know, scaling the community and scaling the project, um, you know, with the numerous managed services that each cloud provider offers, uh, you can get into, you know, what's the best way to support those or, you know, what is the um, limits of the support that we want to implement. And so there's been some discussions um, about, you know, how, is there any way to automate that or do we have to do, you know, a manual implementation of the type of the controller for each um, service um, and you know kind of slows that process down which doesn't scale very well and I think Nick actually had some ideas um, or at least uh, there's one potential project um, that can help maybe automate that. Uh, Nick do you want to talk about um, the was it magic modules? There's <clears throat> um, I, I can but I don't have anything particularly intelligent to say um, if anyone uh, is familiar with, I'm, I'm sure plenty of people here are familiar with uh, Terraform, the HashiCorp product. I think there's a couple of patterns that they've used to um, make the, the burden easier of uh, supporting all these different things. Uh, so, so I just joined the project Crossplane and uh, just added support for Redis and it took a reasonable amount of time. Um, a lot of that was because we're still exploring patterns. Um, and a lot of that is because I'm, I'm new to Crossplane, so I imagine that that will get faster over time with practice, uh, but it still is, it, it would take a good amount of time to implement and maintain all the different features and functionality of all the different things that cloud providers offer. Uh, so one pattern that other tools have taken to, to get that done is to basically, uh, as they become more popular and as they gain traction, is to break out the responsibility of maintaining each cloud provider to a, a team of people who are really passionate about that cloud provider. So, you know, Terraform, for example, is modularized. They have the Google provider and they have the AWS provider, et cetera, et cetera, that are maintained sort of by somewhat different sets of people. Um, Google, furthermore, has got a piece of software called Magic Modules, which is, my understanding is uh, not, it, it's sort of, um, it's not quite complete code generation, but it helps with a lot of templating and things like that. It's almost almost like Kube Builder is my understanding for generating modules based on Google APIs. So it generates Ansible modules and generates Terraform modules. I believe once it's generated, I haven't really done any, uh, you know, I could be, could be wrong here uh, because I haven't looked at it in great detail, but I believe that basically it generates something that then you could take and fill in the gaps to, to have a module. So either we could, perhaps eventually look into using that to, to generate some code or, you know, a couple of other different patterns, but that's the most promising one I've seen so far. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah. So I think that, you know, one final um, thought on that too, is that, you know, Crossplane is, uh, you know, very much a community driven project. So, you know, the set of things, uh, managed services and, um, you know, that end up that get support, or a priority uh, of implementation from the Crossplane project is 
largely up to also what the community wants to see. So if we get, you know, if we hear from folks that, you know, want a particular service to be supported or, you know, um, contributors uh, come to the project from various sources that, you know, want to implement support for a particular service, then that is absolutely, um, you know, uh, fully encouraged from, from, you know, everybody basically um so yeah so what you know it's community driven and what the community wants to see should you know will influence which direction the project goes does that answer your question omar or do you have any more uh, on that one uh that makes sense it's uh well it's, it's been really uh nice to answer that um i, I get i got all the information I, I needed so thank you very much uh, awesome yeah thanks for uh, adding that question to the uh, agenda document today Alrighty, so um, we had started kicking around a, a, um, a topic here about some of the patterns and standards for the cross planes uh, repo. Um, there is some across the different implementations from different developers, uh, we have not fully standardized yet on uh, how a reconciler or a controller should be structured how it could be unit tested, what the unit tests look like. Um, you know, there is some consistency, but we do not have full consistency in a you know, full standard uh, and patterns agreed upon by everyone. So uh, with the folks on the, you know, I wanted to open this up to the community <clears throat> and have a bit of a discussion on that today about you know, what should some of these um, patterns be. And so um, I believe we have, yeah, we have a good quorum, I think, here to discuss that. So let's uh, let's actually start with um, with one of the one of the potentially easier ones. Um, let's actually start at the bottom here. So pull requests. Uh, so during a pull request, um, you know, the it's it's uh, at least somewhat desirable to have it be scoped in size such that uh, the burden on reviewers is more manageable. Um, you know, it's obviously, there's a few reasons for that. One of them being uh, that when you have a, you know, super large pull request with a whole ton of code changes, uh, it gets more difficult to review all of those changes at the same level of quality um, that you can uh, provide when you're focusing on a smaller set. So I wanted to kind of open the floor about, you know, pull requests, uh, you know, what should the scope of them be? or you know, how should they be focused, or is it the size limits, et cetera. And I think that a way to frame that conversation is around uh, the scenario where support for a new type of managed service is, um, is first added. Because with that, uh, when you wanna support a new managed service, uh, such as like MongoDB will be one that's um, coming up in the future. Um, you know, you want to you know, there's an API to design of, you know, what would the portable MongoDB um, abstraction look like, uh, you know, in the CRD form. And then you've got support from various clinical cloud providers or, you know, local operators, et cetera. And so, you know, where do you draw the lines in terms of uh, pull requests that you submit? Um, you have all of that in every single cloud provider and all the APIs, et cetera, into a single pull request. It's thousands and thousands of lines. Uh, so does anybody have any thoughts on pull requests, uh, size, focus, or best practices? Yeah, it seems to me just optimizing for readability is, is the right way to go. Review time. Do uh, have you, there are there um, certain tactics or, or approaches that you found uh, can optim help optimize for readability, Basam? Yeah, I mean, it, the two that I've found is either it's small enough and then it's just, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory or if it's a large enough review, and sometimes you have to make large reviews, uh, then splitting it by commits and just having a like a little guide for the reviewers to go in which order to go through them makes a lot of sense. Like, like sometimes, like sometimes it makes sense to kind of split things, commits that are, um, you know, core code changes and then tests and then 
um, any vendor changes or other, keep those all separate just to optimize for how people read. In GitHub, there's only two ways. You're either going to look at the whole change set or by commit. So, you know, use, use either approaches wisely. Yeah, I, I feel like it's regardless of whether you have a large or a small pull request. Um, well, let me take a step back. In my mind, the only reason the size of the pull request uh, really matters is the potential for merge conflicts uh, for the author for the pull request. Uh, and I say that because I think that it is important to review on a commit by commit basis. I think that it's important that by the time that a pull request is in for review, it should have a commit history that is that tells a story and that makes sense and that is framed for the reviewer. So if there's four commits and the last commit is just fixing a typo in a previous commit, or if a particular piece of functionality is only half working in one commit and then finished off in another commit, I think that's that's sort of a missed pattern at review time. Um, so sometimes when I know a pull request is going to be very large, I will A, get the pull request in early when it's only has partial functionality with a work in progress prefix. Uh, and maybe it'll have two commits and then I will push more commits as I add more and more functionality, but I'll try and make sure that those commits tell a story. And to my mind as a reviewer, um, it is burdensome to have to review a lot of stuff at once, but if someone sends me a large pull request with five commits in it, um, I can just review that as five smaller commits in five different times. I can review one commit, take a break, come back the next day or something like that, review the next commit. Yeah, and I think the, the telling the story part is really interesting because if it is a big change or a big refactor or anything like that, starting with like the foundational pieces and building on them makes it like way more readable. So I'm going to, I'm going to put out some statistics that I only half remember, but uh, a couple of jobs ago I did a tech talk on pull requests and, and how to write a good pull request and review pull requests. And I think the stat was something like 500 lines after that, the average sort of person just, it's, your eyes start to glaze over and it's really hard to actually focus and catch anything important. Um, is, that a, is that language dependent? I can imagine like a 500 lines of Perl, my eyes would glaze over before like 500 lines of, uh, you know, a little bit more easier to grok language. Yeah, one line of Perl over <laughs> glaze over, so that's just my personal. <laughs> skill set. Um, I, I think though that there's a follow on thing there. So, so, so for instance, I, I'm a, my, my Redis PR was an example of a very large uh, pull request that we had had recently. Um, and one thing that would have helped me to do that in bite sized pieces uh, is a faster feedback loop. Um, I, I think that I did get some comments on my APIs when I first put them through and then there was sort of nothing until the pull request was deemed to be sort of ready to go. Uh, and it could be that there was a, um, it could be that maybe there was a sort of a uh, miscommunication there because I had it in work in progress status and it could be that people interpret work in progress as don't look at this until it's done. You know, it's not um, I think the other thing, if, if I was to have done that in literally separate pull requests, I would like to have a better understanding of what the agreement is on, on how we partially implement features in Crossplane. Because to my understanding, there is no feature flags or anything like that in Crossplane at the moment. I, I guess you could just not apply certain CRDs so that, so that the API server is not aware of them. But um, part of my concern and part of the reason I sent it all as one big pull request is because I was like, do we really want to have Redis support that actually doesn't have any cloud providers implementing it at the moment, like just the APIs and no controllers, or do we want to have just a client for GCP and no controller, or do we want to just have full support for GCP, but not for Redis and, uh, sorry, not for uh, AWS and Azure for potentially a week or two or something like that in the code base. And it's totally okay if we do, but I just sort of wanted to talk about that. Yeah, I, 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 the other thing I think that is interesting in this example is getting a design in with the CRDs on both sides, like the abstract ones and the concrete ones, helps get kind of all the early issues figured out before the the rest of the implementation follows. So I think that was that was helpful, and we should probably adopt that as a pattern. 
Yeah, I, I think that mostly worked out. Um, I will say uh, anecdotally, there were a few uh, tweaks to those uh, CRDs going forward. You know, it's one, uh, especially from my perspective as someone who was, you know, taking their first steps into crossplane. Um, I, I did go back and basically change alter my commit history. But when I realized, like, oh, this is a field that I wasn't aware of when I when I first scaffolded the CRDs, it turns out I actually needed to put like provider ID or whatever in, for example, which you know I didn't realize until I got to the controller stage. So I people you know put in what their idea of how the api is going to look is and then that actually changes as they as they get to the sort of meat and potatoes of it hey, Ilya, do you uh, do you want to make a point i see that you're not on mute so I, th I think you're waiting to talk yes uh can you hear me guys yes i can hear you great go ahead uh so uh, i think it's all good i uh, think i don't think i have any specific concerns about the size what i think i would like to add is basic pull request hygiene in terms of scope it is very tempting working on the issue to come across a bug or misprint or something that you attempted to fix in the scope of this pull request, yet to add kind of change which is extraneous to the scope of the pull request. So I'm working on the feature, let's say, well, I'll uh, use the next example, Redis. It is tempting to fix additional issues as you come across them. The challenge with that is kind of introduce the scope spread. So now you're saying, why is this change being introduced here? Is it related to the initial effort adding Redis, or it's something that we simply lump in alone because we came across it? Flip side of it, it's also dangerous in the sense that if for any reasons you decided to roll back this pull request, that bug fix or that uh, spelling change or whatever, that additional miscellaneous item you just added also goes with it out of the uh, repository. So it, I know it's very tempting and I've been biggest <clears throat> offender to add those things in pull request lately adopted the policy that even if the change is <clears throat> very small and benign, I would actually shell out and create new pull requests dedicated to this change alone. I'll get quick feedback with merge and I'll rebase my pull request branch and continue working in the future. Because this way you actually don't accumulate the changes in the pull request which expand beyond the scope of initial feature work. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Ilya. And I, I am definitely guilty of that myself of, you know, there's there's some good feedback about something on the pull request or somebody notices something or I notice something and, you know, I'm in there right now and I, oh, I just want to add that in there and take care of it right now. Scratch that itch, you know. Um, so I think your what your suggestion there or the workflow that you have adopted where you, you know, open up a separate pull request and, uh, you know, fix that uh, issue in isolation. Um, and get that into master and then rebase your pull request is a great way to do it and uh, keeps things clean but also your point about if you need to roll back a pull request if it's got all these other things lumped into it then that gets um, that gets messy and takes away functionality that um, you know might not have been the issue so I, th I think those are those are all really good points um, everybody and oh yeah then Nick one more thing to say to you is that um, you know I when I see work in progress uh, it's not always clear to me when um, it, uh, uh, another review is is necessary so uh, I think as a as a pattern here you know when when the author of a pull request when they push some more commits and they want more feedback to um, you know at mention somebody on the pull request or leave a comment saying hey this is ready for another look you know take a look at what I just added and you know then we can um, get a uh, notification about that and go ahead and take a look at it. Sure. Um, yeah, I kind of want to all echo to that what Jared said. In the past, we've been doing this practice of squashing the commits. So when I see initial pull requests with multiple commits, I'm not quite clear whether those commits will be squashed. So hence, is it okay for me to start reviewing them or should I hold off and wait until pull request being kind of marked as ready? Well, if, if I understand that, I mean, I think I could be jumping to an assumption here, but... Um, there, there obviously should not be a, like a commit and a pull request is a different thing, right? A commit, a pull request shouldn't just be like, I have this one giant commit that adds Redis support uh, because that, that gets to the point that you're like, like you say, if you, if you have to revert something, like you can revert a commit as well as reverting a pull request. It's much more granular. So at that point, you, you, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you're like, here's my 11,000 line diff. It's all in one commit. So I can't really do much about it so 
Uh, but I can understand that there's two different styles of how people use commits. And, and sometimes people use commits by they'll accumulate, you know, many commits in a put request and then inside and then they'll, they'll squash them all into something at the end. It's kind of their work in progress thing. Um, I, I don't know what to suggest there, but I, I, I feel strongly that commits should not be in that stage by the time that you're asking for a reviewer to look at them. And I personally try and keep my commits, uh, I, I personally try not to push my commits to origin until they're ready for a reviewer to look at them. So in my, in, like if, if a commit of mine makes it to origin, then at the time that I'm pushing that commit, I feel that it's ready for someone to look at if there's a pull request open and it's made it to origin. Uh, I may every now and again, go back and rebase that history to add a field or something like that, but I typically won't be making any dramatic changes. Uh, get, getting further on, I can, I can speak uh, or go rather back to what we were talking about with uh, pull request scope. Um, I actually slightly disagree with that. Um, I, I do, of course, agree that multiple changes, uh, I, of course, agree that within a commit, you should be doing one thing. Um, I personally feel like if the contract becomes that if you see a typo or something like that while working on a pull request, you have to go and open another pull request, I won't do it. It's too much effort. Like, it's uh, why would I do that now? I'll do that later. I can't be bothered creating a new branch, stashing everything, creating a new pull request, sending it, going back to what I was doing before, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I personally feel fine with having small code cleanups in a separate commit. I, and you know, I'll, I'll defer to what the community wants here, but but I, I guess I'm making the point that I don't think it's fundamentally wrong for a pull request to have some extra stuff in it. In fact, I think shooting for the uh, most pull requests to refactor something small that they find along the way in a separate self-contained commit is a great way to encourage uh, overall better code health. Yeah, I think I think well, <clears throat> yeah, it could possibly you know, get to a discussion too about the, the scope of, you know, some of those other changes. Like if it's like, you know, a typo or something like that, that's pretty clear. You can kind of, you know, include that in or visit like an entire, you know, you're changing an interface and, and, you know, that has tendrils that go, you know, throughout the whole rest of the code base and gets kind of, kind of messy, then, you know, that's, that scope seems uh, too much to be included, you know? So I guess it's a, a judgment call at the end of the day. Uh, I, I think mostly the important thing is here, you know, uh, sort of Ilya and I may have slight, you know, disagreements on the philosophy here. Uh, I, I think the important thing is for us as a project to have a stance. I, I don't personally mind what the stance is and make it clear what the stance is so that people know how to meet the expectations of the project. Got it. Um. Yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, that that Ilya's Ilya's um, original point, I think, is 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 probably still something that I would I would side on of of you know in not letting um, things that are unrelated get involved in the same pull request. Uh, that's probably where where I would uh, side on. But I think that you know being able to define that um, more clearly, I think, is something that uh, we'd have to do, you know, maybe after this meeting sometime. Uh, do we typically, should we take an action item to, to follow up on this? Yeah, yeah, we, um, we can include that down uh, in the action item section. That could be like in our contributor guide. Okay. All right. So um, I, th I thought that was going to be the quick one. Uh, we have 22 minutes left. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a quick break here. And um, I, I want to, <clears throat> before we get into this, uh, like controller paradigm saying, I think, because that's going to possibly have some meat to it.
I want to go ahead and uh, open to the community here. Anyone else on the call that, uh, you know, is there, are there any other community topics or questions or discussions that uh, anybody wants to bring up here that uh, if you were not able to add it to the agenda document before this meeting, um, you can go ahead and suggest that now before we dive back down into uh, you know, the, this topic here. All righty, let's dive. All right, so um, Ilya, are you still are you still in transit, or are you at a safe, comfortable place now? Yeah, I'm in office right now. I'm in office, so oh, I'm here. Cool. All righty, so um, so let, let's take a quick look at uh, well, quick, relatively quick uh, look at this controller paradigms here. So we have sort of three different approaches right now across the uh, controllers and the reconcilers for how they interact with cloud provider APIs and how they are tested. So I have um, a couple of examples on my screen here. And so there's three different ones that uh, let's take a quick look at and then we'll, we'll have a discussion. So one is where the reconciler uh, gets a provider focused API interface. So each the reconciler, um, you know, gets a API that is focused, uh, sorry, an interface that's focused entirely on the uh, cloud provider, um, the cloud providers API surface. And then they'll use that object uh, throughout its reconcile loop to uh, you know, the, to kind of closely mimic what the cloud providers API is. That's one approach. And a second approach here is where we have overridable member functions of the reconciler. So in the reconciler, uh, you know, it's can connect, it'll create uh, an instance, it'll sync that instance for an external uh, cloud provider resource, and it can delete that instance. And so these functions here can be directly overridden or set uh, to mocked implementations from the unit tests, uh, which obviously helps for testability at that, you know, level that's at the granularity of inside a reconcile function. And then we have a third pattern here that uh, creates an interface for uh, each one of those functions, the create, sync, delete, uh, and the key interface as well. Uh, so I would like to open the floor to, um, to kind of discuss you know, the merits of, of them, uh, pros and cons, and see if we have uh, sort of agreement about uh, what standard we should follow. Um, I'll, I'll actually start that with the comment of, I think this particular pattern where you get a provider focused API object is probably the weakest um, because what ends up happening is that in your reconcile loop, you've got that provider object, but if you wanted to test reconcile, you've got to mock out all the individual calls of that pro provider focused interface, which is ends up with a lot of mocking for, um, for being able to test a one particular scenario. Uh, it's, it's too granular, essentially, is what I'm saying, uh, versus a pattern like this, um, where you have overridable member functions, you get to mock at a higher layer. So if you wanted to test reconcile, uh, you wouldn't have to implement, uh, you know, all the provider APIs um, and at, that, at a small granular level, you can just stub out or mock, you know, create with a single function to say return success. It's okay. I'm, I'm not focusing on create. I'm focusing on sync. Uh, so that ends up being a more granular uh, approach. So I think that uh, mocking the entire um, provider focus API is is probably the weakest of the three patterns. Um, so with that being said, I'll open the floor to discussion about um, if anybody wants to refute that um, assertion or the discussion about the overridable member functions versus uh, having an interface for all of them that is returned from a connect function. Uh, Jared, I want to jump in a little bit and further clarify your point about the provider interface. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of, I think that's not necessarily uh, better or worse. Uh, I would say that it's slightly orthogonal to the overall pattern. We do use clients, provider as a clients, right? And we do provide them as a interfaces with mockable or fake clients objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one angle of it. Uh, second pattern with the stop functions versus interface. Uh, comes on the reconcile side, those are specifically geared towards the testing uh, reconcile loop or yes. reconciler itself. So it's not necessarily that the provider was 
inefficient or weaker. It just simply addresses a slightly different topic. And we kind of can address them separately. So there's a client side with their own mocks and their own fake clients and interfaces. And there is now a reconciled side of it, which will use those in its own term. But for now, we we'll probably can just simply maybe focused on the reconciler itself with the stop functions and uh, interfaces. And with that said, I kind of just get my two cents into the uh, this specific topic to say that I think the interfaces is the goal preferred way to provide testing for the basically exposing internal components for testing. Uh, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the reason why I lean or initially start using stop functions just sheer simplicity, how simple it is to add and implement with the least possible lines of code functionality, which effectively being addressed in the same way by the interfaces. So that's kind of that's the only meaningful justification for that. If we adopt the interface pattern, I don't mind at all, except to just, again, in my opinion, was a little bit more involved. With that said, with caveat, Golang itself does not provide really good, meaningful testing when it comes down to testing the members of the same struct. And I think I point to you, Jared, I actually asked that in the <laughs> Stack Overflow this question and basically answer was, how do you test member function? And answer is that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you showed me that, yeah. Right, it was downvoted horribly and I said, okay, fine. <laughs> point is that if yes if you want to test member of the same struct then kind of you get stuck and adding this blood of the interfaces kind of almost gets on the way saying yeah I just only want to stab out this one single function do I really want to create now interface which I will pass as a into a new constructor to do this all these things just to step out the function and if the answer is yes I don't see anything wrong with that an example which Nick did in the Redis I think to, totally palatable to me this is what I think I had initially and the reason why I kind of step away from that because again I would just didn't want to do that for every single reconciler. That's all. So yeah, the the Redis uh, patent uh, was was mine, um, and the reason I arrived there was in my mind an evolution of uh, what I'll call Ilya's patent, the sort of uh, replaceable methods on the uh, on the structures that I was shown in gke.go. Uh, I think when you have this highlighted in yellow here, uh, it looks like it's a hell of a lot more code than those replaceable st structs. Uh, I think that part of that is because I've broken it out into four separate interfaces, whereas in practice, I only have a class that creates sync delete key around, for example, but it's go best practice to offer a minimal scope. So actually, my tests, which will pass a uh, create sync delete around, should actually be possible or a deleter or a sinker around to, to uh, pass around the smallest possible interface. Uh, as a side note, I'm currently working on introducing linting to our code base, which would actually call out things like that. Um, it also looks like a lot more code because there's a lot more comments on it, uh, because I tend to be quite a stickler for putting comments on everything. Um, so the reason that I, but the reason functionally that I switch to interfaces um, arguably is a little bit more philosophical than pragmatic or a little bit more um, idiomatic than pra pragmatic. Um, I, I feel like the pattern with the replaceable stub functions uh, does a very good job of what it was designed to do, which is essentially making uh, objects more testable, but it doesn't actually separate out, doesn't actually separate out the concerns of, of what's happening. So basically in the reconcile loop, you've got this piece of reconcile code that takes a CRD and then calls out to another function that says, okay, here's my CRD. Uh, I have decided as part of the reconcile loop that the CRD is in such and such a state, so it needs to be deleted, or it's in this state, so I think it needs to be created, or it's in this state, so I think it needs to be sent. And then it passes it off to a function to enact that, and that function is aware of the cloud provider and the implementation. Uh, in the case of the replaceable stub functions, that's actually all of that functionality and all of that logic and all the things it needs to talk to Kubernetes and the cloud provider and everything and needed to reconcile is all just part of one reconciler struct. So I tried to break that out into two separate objects, basically. So in, in my design, the goal was that the reconciler, this is all very hypothetical. And this is how my mind works. Like, <coughs> of course, in practice, we only ever want to reconcile with a cloud provider. But the way that I designed this is, what if we wanted to reconcile with, what if we some for some reason wanted to reconcile 
our Azure Redis spec with something that wasn't Azure? Could we just easily swap that out with something else that could take a Red, uh, an Azure Redis spec and, and uh, apply it elsewhere? Uh, of course, in practice, we're not going to do that. But when you think about the API in that way, it tends to lend itself to more testable APIs uh, in, in a fashion that doesn't feel like you've written it purely to make it more testable. So when I read the stub function pattern, to me, it's like, yeah, this works, but there's this there's this whole pattern and whole code here that is only really useful for testing. You know, those those functions are only ever set to the, you know, there's there's an initializer that says like, am I not in a test? Okay, add these functions in sort of thing, or and that lets you override them. So I, I tried to take the pattern and sort of just have the same functionality uh, in a fashion that was designed more for like, what if this was a real API library that someone was trying to use uh, sort of thing, and maybe they want to swap out the cloud provider uh, implementation or something like that. I don't know if that kind of makes sense. I, I do agree that it is a little more code, uh, but I don't typically strive for minimum code as, as, as sort of a as sort of part of what I'm trying to deliver. Uh, I think side effect also, I think I like it in general. I think that's what the idiomatic goal should be. And again, I have no strong opinion one way or another. However, would it kind of start a little bit falling apart for me? Uh, again, once you start entertaining these possibilities where let's say now your um, sync function will need to call yet another function, which needs to be marked as well. And kind of you get this almost like chain of calls which uh, you can also address with interfaces, but it becomes a little bit clunky, in my opinion, with the solve it with interface. Uh, again, that's just my take on it. But again, I would definitely preface that this is entire code was intended to address solely testability, not extending the reconciler to be a like API object to be extensible and uh, uh, I guess used in that context. Hence, uh, my goal was to come up with the least possible facets to facilitate testing. Yeah, I think I'm not doing a very good job of communicating myself, communicating myself here, rather. Um, I guess what I'm saying is what I've learned is that often the best way to build an API that is testable in an idiomatic fashion is to pretend like you are building something that actually has components. No, no, uh, yeah, I, I think I understand. And I, I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's a good approach. Yeah. Come on. yeah so, um, so what, uh, in the unit tests themselves, like, um, do we, we start seeing a, a divergence in the testing patterns uh, be based on these two uh, approaches where you know you just override a like, set a member of a, a function directly versus creating an interface to um, you know supply that behavior in a testing scenario so in in the tests uh, funnily enough this this mocking out uh, member functions um, member uh, methods pattern. Uh, I, uh, Ilya I, or someone on Crossplay and did have a pattern for the clients that they used to talk to the cloud provider where they have sort of replaceable, uh, pardon me, uh, member functions. And I quite liked that. So I think the spirit of how the, uh, of how things are sort of uh, in the test is not too different. However, I will say that the tests that I wrote for Redis different from the rest of them because I did not use Go Mega and I used a lot more table-driven testing. Um, so if you look at the tests back to back, they look quite different, but I think that's just because I used a different test. Pattern. I don't personally like Go Mega very much. Um, so I wanted to sort of give a shot at doing it pretty much with just, I just used the base Go testing library uh, and a tool that's basically reflect.dp equal that gives uh, slightly better human readable diffs. Yeah, uh, I think just two points there. Uh, the thank you for the positive comment about the <laughs> client fake tests. I think that's the uh, I kind of when I start looking and implementing those, I borrowed heavily from the Kubernetes itself and control runtime where they introduce fake fake client whether it's for Kubernetes API or for runtime, which I think is a great idea to always if you write something which has interface to provide fake client to it, 
so you can easily stab it out and mug. Uh, on the table driven test and Gomega. Uh, Gomega has been used, I think, just as inertia because initial uh, queue builder scaffolding comes with the Gomega scaffold tests. <clears throat> and we use using basically them only, if I'm not mistaken, for assertion. We don't do anything beyond that. We just simply assert the values. I have no problem of letting Gomega go. There is no any functional need for them beyond that. Uh, when it comes to table-driven tests, I'm actually fine with them as well. I think that's, again, that's the probably preferred paradigm. Uh, one thing I would definitely say that it's definitely easy to add new table-driven tests because you just simply add new entry in the table. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to troubleshoot. Again, it depends if you exercise good hygiene for table-driven tests where each test case entry is identifiable so you can easily identify it. And perhaps another maybe minor need I would have with table-driven test, it's sometimes it's a little bit harder to rerun a specific table test case. You will actually, let's say if you have a pretty large table, let's say 10 test cases and nine is failing, you basically, if you want to step through it and debug it, you'll force to rerun first eight and then just to get to nine tests to run. Again, those are minor picks. I, I think I like all the benefits table-driven tests provide, so I'm willing to live with that inconvenience if that's the case. So that I also want to get a little bit back uh, flow on the history here as a cube builder, specifically to reconcile. If you use plain cube builder, brand new project and you create and scaffold your first operator, you will notice that cube builder offers slightly different process to what comes down to test and reconcile. They favor uh, to use more integration type of tests where they will actually strap the etcd control uh, etcd process and cube api process to kind of get this testing going more in integration like level as you can see we're doing in the api tests in api tests it's kind of nice to have this ability to validate apis i think i found in reconciler it becomes a little bit burdensome and unnecessarily complicated i actually and i noticed nick also follow the same paradigm but we basically unit test reconcile method or methods within the reconciler struct instead of doing this kind of a synchronous run of reconciler and watching for the events and do all this more in integration type facet. So I think that's what we're doing right now. What emerging as a reconciler paradigm, I think it's we're kind of on the right track. Whether it's table driven, I'm totally fine to adapt it. I think I like it. And the way Nick wrote them, they very clean and passable to me. So uh, I don't I don't have any strong preferences using table driven versus not table driven. And I think just to close the loop, I think I'm actually also good to accept the interface approach versus tab functions. The amount of code, it doesn't bother me as well, just to, again, to be in the terms of uh, standardized in one approach. And since it's idiomatic go away kind of do things, I think anyone who will come new to project will quickly understand what's going on versus to look in this stab method uh, prefix underscore function called and say, what is this Python? What I'm looking for. <laughs> so, uh, yes. So, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, so we got, we have to wrap uh, wrap up this conversation now, unfortunately. Um, but I will add that uh, I, I have found GoMega very clunky. It's supposed to be expressive and readable, uh, but I found it clunky. Um, so I'm happy to get rid of GoMega. It was only an artifact, really, from the initial cube builder patterns. And then removing that whole spinning up etcd and making tests much faster and not having an integration focus has been amazing. So I, I, I like that a lot better. Um, so we can finish, uh, continue this conversation on Slack. Um, and, and what, what I suggest the action item would be, let's capture the ideal reconciler pattern in terms of the code structure and test structure and communicate with community and basically kind of adopt it uh, by vote or by sign up, signing on. Yeah, I, I was gonna make a, suggest a similar action. And I would say as a, as a follow on to that, um, I don't think there's really anything, um, well, uh, when I when I was new to the community uh, and I was trying to uh, uh, build my own controller, uh, I did find uh, Ilya's pattern quite easy to read. Uh, so I would say that if we are going to go back and retroactively rewrite or refactor existing controllers, um, I would obviously heavily focus on the ones that don't use either the create, sync, delete uh, method pattern or the interface one. I, I basically take the ones that are that first pattern or no pattern refactor them because I don't, I don't think the the ones using create sync delete methods are broken at the moment sort of thing i think it would be a minor optimization to refactor them 
whereas the other ones are pretty hard to follow and pretty clunky, so they would benefit a lot from refactoring. That's a good point. All right, yeah, so we have a hard stop in two minutes. And so uh, Daniel uh, reached, so we're going to move on to the pull request. So Daniel uh, reached out to me and said that he will have an update to this, uh, incorporating all of our feedback uh, by the end of, I think this week is what he's targeting. So we should be able to review this again and for uh, adding Azure resource groups. And um, we have some uh, feedback about the logging um, infrastructure or, you know, consolidating on what logging package we want to use. Um, so I don't know if, uh, if you know, it's on the line here, but we hopefully will get an update on that sometime soon. We should, uh, we should add a comment to this to ping Vino and see if there's, uh, if, if um, we get an update soon. And I think, yeah. Nick, this is a pull request you opened very recently uh, about binding state. So we, I don't think we, anyone's taken a look at it yet. So we just have to follow up and, and take a look at that as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty small. So. <laughs> All righty. So that is everything we had in the agenda doc. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and wrap it up uh, today here. Pretty much right on time. Um, unless anybody has some closing words, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. I don't know if that grinding noise is closing words or if that's a side, a side comment. <laughs> but all right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good week, everyone. Okay.